Okay, so in the new <clears throat> time period that we're studying, the Baroque, one of the most important things that you need to understand is that we are looking at art that is considered to be Catholic Counter-Reformation art. So let's talk about how the Catholic Counter-Reformation came to be. The first thing that happens is that the religious Catholic scholars get together and they say, you know, this art's just a little wacky. It's really, really weird, the things you guys have been giving us. So we have to think back to the Renaissance time and the mannerism period that we studied. The Catholic Church right now is getting art that is mannerist. And they're saying, this stuff is odd, it's hanging in our church, and we need to set some guidelines as to what we expect our art to look like. So the Catholic Counter-Reformation decide or is based on this meeting that happens at the Council of Trent. Um, the Council of Trent is a group of people who sit down and set guidelines. And they set guidelines and rules for the Catholic Church. They decide what goes in the Catholic Church and the practices of the Catholic Church. And so what they decided was that if it was going to be in the church, the art had to be as clear as possible. It had to be um, as realistic as possible, even if that meant that the subject matter was going to be grotesque. It had to stick to doctrine, which meant that it had to be true to... Um, it had to be true to the church. It had to be true to biblically correct. Um, and that it needed to evoke a pious response. So the observer needed to feel moved in some way when looking at it. So those are the new guidelines. And we're going to look at some artwork and see how those guidelines affect the artwork. So we're going to talk about St. Peter's in Rome. Uh, this is probably the most iconic symbol of the Catholic Church. And uh, the building gave opportunity for fine art. There's um, many sculptures, statues, paintings, uh, all in the building. Um, the piazza, the oval piazza was designed by Bernini and added later. Um, and that centers around this obelisk. It's that statue thing that you see in the center of the oval. Uh, so Carlo Moderno is the one that designs the facade of St. Peter's. But originally Michelangelo was the one that designed it. Uh, unfortunately, Michelangelo... Uh, designed it in his older age and died before he could see the fruition of the building. So Moderno took over and the public felt that Moderno did a poor job of taking over the project. Um, Michelangelo designs the entire floor plan, Moderno finishes the facade, and the public is very upset because as you walk towards the building, the dome disappears. They felt like the dome was an important part of the building and that it needed to be seen no matter where you stood. The public felt that uh, Moderno did not work well with uh, Michelangelo's design at all. And unfortunately for Moderno, 
the public really felt that that was like an epic fail and it pretty much ended his career in Italy altogether. Okay, so let's talk about um, the building that started it all. The building that <clears throat> Martin Luther went to Rome to see and saw um, the new building and got ticked off and went back and nailed the thesis to the wall or to the church door and started the Protestant Reformation. It was this building right here. It is the new St. Peter's, the Vatican in Rome. Now why, let's refresh our memories, why was Martin Luther so mad about this building? He was mad about this building because the Pope was selling indulgences in order to pay for the construction of the building. The building was very expensive. Uh, he had hired very famous architects. Um, and artists to construct the building. And unfortunately, they were running out of money. So they decided that they would things called indulgences. And indulgences were pieces of paper that bought time off of purgatory for those who purchased them. So if you're Catholic, you believe in a heaven, a hell, and an in-between called purgatory. Um, my understanding is that everybody goes to purgatory, uh, depending on what they need to work out in their life before they go to heaven. So it's kind of an in-between place. Um, and sometimes like if you're need to learn a lesson or something, or you have to work those things out through purgatory. And so, uh, being able to buy time off of purgatory meant that you could go to heaven more quickly. So, uh, I'm not Catholic. Uh, if I got that wrong and you are Catholic, I apologize. Uh, but that's my basic understanding of how that works. So at any rate, they were selling indulgences to buy time off of purgatory, and that really ticked off Martin Luther. Goes back to the Germany and nails the 95 Theses to the wall. The Catholic Counter-Reformation is now in full swing, and these works that we are studying are representations of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. So this building was designed by Michelangelo, Carlo Maderno, and Bernini. Maderno and Michelangelo collaborated about the building. Michelangelo actually was the one who designed the main body of the building, but Moderno designed the facade. And so there were some problems with the facade of the building. Um, but before we get into that, let me tell you just a little bit about the building itself. Um... It's the most important symbol of the Catholic Church right now. Um, and inside, it gave the opportunity for fine art. Um, the oval piazza was designed by Bernini and was added later. So the long arms that you're seeing that come forward, they were added later. Um, and so was the obelisk or the tower that's in the center. Pope Alexander VII CG is the one who um, commissions the arms or the um, piazza from Bernini. Um, he really loves Bernini's work, but he doesn't have a whole lot of money, and so that's why he waits until the end of the finishing of St. Peter's to commission this piece from Bernini. But also he wanted, um, he just really wanted a wow stopper and Bernini was one of those artists that was able to do that and so um, he knew that the piazza would be a great place for that. So <clears throat> let's talk about Moderno's facade. So what happened is that Moderno creates the front of the building. The facade is actually the very front of the building or the piece that you see first uh, in this case, it's the piece with the columns. Um, there was a lot of 
um, 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 over the facade. It wasn't real popular with the people of Rome, and it wasn't real popular with the Pope either. The problem was Michelangelo had designed this gorgeous dome, and as you get closer to the facade, the dome disappears. And I think they wanted to be able to still see the dome as you get closer to the facade. So that problem was a real issue, and Bernini ingeniously finds a way to fix that. He does it with these... Uh, with the design of the piazza, the piazza itself is elongated and it's an oval at the end. Um, and basically, if you walk to the end of the piazza, you can still see the dome. The piazza has um, colonnades that cover the walkways so that the crowd can stand while um, religious things are going on and be protected from the elements. Um, in the summer, it gets really, really hot in Rome. And so it provides shade. Um, the exterior is something that really it guides your encounter with St. Peter's. Because as you approach, the arms welcome you. Um, this art is grandiose. It means it's larger than life. The idea behind it is larger than life, but it is literally huge. Um, the other thing interesting is there's a spot right in front at the top. You can barely see it. Uh, if you look at the dome and your eyes go forward, you can see a little window in the roof. And the Pope will walk out and stand there and give a blessing um, on important holidays, Easter Sunday and things like that. And so a lot of times the crowd will gather in that area. And so the arms encompass a large area so that people can go in to the area um, and lots of people can be welcomed and blessed. Um... Some people, or some art historians, look at the shape of the arms and call it a key shape. It is a key shape, and um, some believe it is a symbol of the key to heaven. This is Pope Alexander Seventh CG. Uh, he loves Bernini's work, but he doesn't have enough money to commission works for, from him. And so um, he waits until Bernini's becomes old age and he has enough money to commission a work of art from Bernini. Um, CG is from a family of bankers that were very powerful during the Renaissance time and he wants Bernini to finish St. Peter's. If you recall the issue with the bell tower in which Michelangelo designed the front facade but that the dome disappeared as you got closer to the facade, um, St. Peter's really didn't have a regular piazza. Um, that welcoming area that we see often uh, before you get to the main church. Uh, that was a ancient Roman protocol and standard. And so CG wants a grand formal entry uh, that's designed in the humanistic style. And he wants something that has a regular symmetrical space. And so he felt that it would be really cool if the facade could have arms that welcome the viewers. And so he commissions the front or the for the forum the welcoming piazza from bernini in his old age so this is the piazza that um bernini designs for the pope 
Pope Alexander the Seventh CG. Um, the exterior of the piazza guides your encounter with St. Peter's from the outside. So, meaning the arms guide your experience as you come to the church. Now, some people think that the arms look like a keyhole, sort of like if you can imagine one of those old um, old locks that have a skeleton key to them. Some people feel that this looks like a keyhole. Um, it can be interpreted that this particular part of the building creates this keyhole shape, meaning that um, St. Peter's is the key to heaven. Others feel that the uh, colonnade that wraps around the piazza is simply a arm extension of the church. So a way to welcome the visitor, a way to reach out to the visitor. You see that there's a colonnade that runs the entire length of the piazza. That colonnade uh, is a covered walkway or a loggia. Uh, that provides shade and uh, protection from the elements when St. Peter's uh, gets crowded in the piazza. Every year um, the Pope comes and stands at the top of the building to bless all that are in the piazza. Uh, Bernini guides your encounter with St. Peter's in a very visual manner. It's visual if you can see it from an aerial view, but it feels unusual when you get into the building because it has an irregular shape. Um, it's an irregular trapezoid shape. And so it just kind of feels unusual. The building St. Peter's itself is looked at as an apostolic palace. Um, I've never actually been to St. Peter's or to Rome to see the Vatican, uh, but I have known people that go and say it's really a larger-than-life experience that's hard to comprehend. Um, in the idea of that apostolic palace, the Pope comes out a couple times a year and designates a blessing from the top of the building. Uh, he blesses the city of Rome and the world around it on Easter and New Year's. The name of the blessing is called an Urubi et Orbi blessing. The sweeping movement of the shape of the arms is somewhat restless. It wants you to keep moving. It longs for you to walk into the building. It leads the viewer directly into the building. The arms have a sense of motion, which seems strange, right? Because they're just sitting there. It's not like anything's actually moving. What is moving, though, is the positive and negative space between the colonnade. Mm. The regular uh, repetition of the columns tends to make it feel like the viewer needs to continue walking inside. It also helps the facade look nice and tall, because if you recall... We just talked about it, how the people who lived in the area or the people who saw St. Peter's after the facade was designed by Michelangelo were very upset and felt like the facade was ugly because the dome disappeared as you got closer to the building. Now, with Bernini's arms, it makes the church feel larger. 
it helps elongate visually the way it helps elongate the building visually. It is definitely a more visually pleasing way of approaching the facade of the building and the dome itself. Long before the Pope started working on the exterior of Old Saint, or New St. Peter's, he started designing the interior of St. Peter's. Um, part of that was Michelangelo's vision, um, but he knew that he wanted the interior to be lavishly decorated with fine art, and he decided that he was going to ask Bernini to do a work of art in the interior before he asks him to design the piazza. So Bernini's first commission was completed in 1624, um, or it was completed between 1624 and 1633. It's a gigantic bronze baldacchino, and it sits underneath the Great Dome. It stands 100 feet high. That's the height of an average eight-story building. Um, the baldacchino serves both functional and symbolic purposes. It marks the high altar of the tomb of St. Peter, and it provides a visual bridge um, in terms of scale for the large dome that is above it. If the baldacchino wasn't there, you would walk into the building and just feel swallowed by the building because it is so very big and massive. And so the baldacchino kind of creates a relationship between the building and the viewer. Um, its columns create a visual frame for the elaborate sculpture that presents the throne of St. Peter. And at the far end, of St. Peter's. Um, there's a structure that has decorative elements to speak to the power of the Catholic Church. This particular piece um, talks about Pope Urban VIII's power. He is the Pope at the time and it talks about the power that he has with his family and the influence in the church. Um, we see that there are partially fluted and uh, columns and wreaths and vines. The baldacchino has four spiral columns. At the top of the columns, we see four colossal angels that stand guard at the upper corners of the canopy. At the canopy's apex, we see an orb and a cross, and this serves as the symbol of the church's triumph over the Reformation. So let's look at the baldacchino a little bit closer. So Pope Urban VIII was from a family called the Barberis, who are a very powerful family in Rome. Um, and the baldacchino features uh, a symbol of Pope Urban VIII's family. They are bumblebees. Um, the construction of the baldacchino in itself was a really remarkable feat. Um, each of the columns are made of bronze and they consist of five sections that are cast from wooden models and they use the was last, lost wax process um, that was began in antiquity. Um, this is the first time that's been used. So he contracted out much of the work for the project to more experienced broadcasters and sculptors. The um, superstructure is predominantly cast of bronze, and some of the sculptural elements are brass or wood. Uh, some of the sculptural elements also have a wood underneath, and then the brass is formed over top of it.
So the enormous scale required a considerable amount of bronze. Um, and so Pope Urban VIII decides that he's going to go to a different building in Rome and dismantle the bronze in it. It is called the Pantheon. And the Pantheon had bronze recessed coffers. They're squares that are indentations, and they had these beautiful bronze stars. And so he says, oh, tear down the Pantheon. Well, the Pantheon was built in Rome in antiquity to honor multiple gods, or all of the Roman gods in the 4th century. And so he decides that, you know what, we want to honor... Um, one god, and therefore this is a symbol of us rejecting the old Roman ways and setting up a new one for everyone to worship. And so, really, um, it's the church's rejection of paganism. Uh, the canopy itself marks the burial of St. Peter, and like I said, there's a sphere with a cross that marks the triumph of the church uh, over the Protestants in the Catholic Counter-Reformation disagreement. So the Catholics are using this piece to say, hey, we won. Um, the bees, the vines, and the sun are all symbols of Pope Urban VIII's family, and there is a family crest, which we're going to look at more closely in a minute. It really has this organic feeling to it. It's um, a feeling of dynamism. It has a feeling of motion um, because of the twisting of the spirals, but also because the grand scale of the Baldacchino. Okay, here you can see those colossal angels in the upper left-hand corner and the right-hand corner that I spoke about. The little cherubs or puti are sitting at the top. Um, you cannot see in this photograph the orb and the cross that's at the very, very top. Um, but you see that the puti has a key, and it is the key to um, the gates of heaven. You can see all of the um, brass that is the lighter color on top of the darker bronze. Um, and you can see the bumblebees. And you can see Pope Urban VIII's uh, family crest and symbols here. In the center, you can see the um, cross and the dove, which is the representation of the Holy Spirit ascending into heaven. Okay, this is a close-up of Pope Urban VIII's family crest. You can see more clearly the bees um, and the vines. These large keys are part of the crest, of the family crest. And then, of course, um, the vines here are, that wrap around the columns and the sun um, that we saw in the center what is part of Pope Urban VIII's family crest. Okay, so this statue is by Bernini. It is a sculpture that was sculpted for the Vatican. It now sits in the Borghese Gallery in Rome. Um, the reason we study this statue, or the statue becomes so very important, is because it's a really good example of the hallmarks of the Baroque time period. So let's go back to those hallmarks that we wrote down and go through them and see how we see the Baroque hallmarks in this particular piece of artwork. Um, obviously, we said religious subject matter is the norm. This is the subject matter of... David uh, slaying Goliath. But we have this new ultimate realism that's coming into play. It's this split second timing that depicts the story of what we're looking at. And so when you look at this, you'll see that we are watching as David 
or Bernini gives us that split second that David is getting ready to fling the slingshot at the giant. His body is torqued and twisted just as if he's getting ready to throw the sling. It feels as if the statue could just magically move. We see the movement or know the movements that come after what the pose has been portrayed to us as. Um, you can see David's feet set wide apart and you know if he took a step the back leg would come off of the platform. So that new realism in storytelling is becoming very very important. Um, obviously humanism is being practiced here. Uh, this is the human depiction of what happened in a biblical story. Um, and really the sculpture invades our space. It invades our space because you as the viewer, if you were standing there and the sculpture were to come to life, it would reach out and whack you in the face, right? Or instead of being contained into one spot like Michelangelo's David was, the sculpture comes out into our area. It reaches out into space. You could fit your entire arm through the space that uh, David has holding the sling. And so these large gaps in the sculpture itself create a new sense of realism that you, the viewer, become part of. Okay, so here we have another piece by Bernini. And your book has this really incredible view of this particular piece of artwork, and so I really encourage you to look at the book's um, picture of this particular piece. Um, this is a scene that is of mystical commune, which means that it's a scene of St. Teresa's ecstasy, and it's her interaction with the divine. Um, this is obviously counter-reformation priest. St. Teresa's family was Jewish, and her family was forced to convert um, to Catholicism. Um, she writes an autobiography that's a bestseller in the 1600s, and the highlight of the biography is to define her physical contact with the divine, um, or to talk about divine communion. And so there's a passage in her biography that talks about her connection with an angel. Um, the angel comes down to her while she levitates. And Bernini decides that he wants to depict her encounter with the angel. Um, the book was really read as a how-to guide, as a way to, con to contact the divine. Um, but let's look at what Bernini does in the sculpture that makes it so very Baroque. For one thing, Bernini's capitalizing on something that's brand new that we haven't looked at yet, and that is the ability to create an entire scene. He wants you to be transformed 100% completely when you experience this sculpture. It's almost like this is the ancient idea of film um, or the ultimate idea of being transported to a different world. And so he's trying to take you to another place, to take you into St. Teresa's world. So at one time you would have walked up close to the statue and to see St. Teresa's face, which has incredible emotion to it. Um, and you can see that the angel is getting ready to plunge a arrow into St. Teresa's body. And it's that moment 
that um, she interacts with the angel that Bernini chooses to depict. And once again, that's that split second timing. How does it come into our space and into our world? It's with the environment that Bernini creates. He wants to suck you into the environment so that you can feel what St. Teresa feels. Um, you can see the sunburst rays coming down from the top onto St. Teresa. And the angel looks at her quite at her, as if she's giving her something good. The robes are very fling. It's as if wind or movement is going through the clothing. Um, and if you look at your book, you can see that Teresa's face is just absolutely in ecstasy. Um, and Bernini, if I could depict a face in ecstasy, Bernini's face would come to mind, in my opinion. Um, and so let's look at some closer pictures of this sculpture. Okay, so I told you we were going to look closer at Bernini's sculpture, and I lied. We're actually going to take a step back and look at the environment that Bernini creates. So you see that there's a marble railing there in front of the sculpture. It gives you an idea of how large the sculpture or environment really is. It's uh, about the size of half of a person, or the half the height probably I'd say about four feet tall. And so you get an idea of how tall this thing really is. Um, it's in the Coronara Chapel, so in the church of Santa Maria della Vittoria in Rome. And the church is fairly large. Um, and so this commission from Bernini was one that Bernini decides that he's going to create an entire environment. And we talked about that a little bit ago, but now you can see the grand scope of the environment that he creates. When you went into the room, he wants to take you to another place. And so you see the clouds above in the arch of the chapel. Those are so well done by Bernini. We don't know what's painting and what is sculpture. Part of it is painting, part of it is sculpture. And it just blends together to create this beautiful culmination of an experience. Um, you can see that there are two boxes, one on the right and the left, of people who are looking onto the ex or the scene of the ecstasy of St. Teresa as if they were in a theater watching the event take place. Uh, you can see the use, the heavy use of gold. Um, The church actually almost did not canonize St. Teresa, but Philip II, who was the king of Spain, um, and was very prestigious, uh, decided that Bernini shows enough of St. Teresa's uh, enough of St. Teresa's saint qualities that Philip II writes a letter to the Pope and says, hey, you know, we need to canonize this woman. Um, Bernini visualizes the church church's process about how we recognize the saint. Um, the space really unifies itself. There is no separation between one thing and another. It really becomes a total sculpture, uh, even though part of its architecture. Bernini really is able to make the architecture like sculpture, and that is something that nobody else has done yet. So it is pretty incredible to see Bernini's ability to um, take architecture and sculpture, mesh it all together, including painting, and transform us into a new 
place. So this is Borromini's church, San Carlo al Quattro Fontaine. It was built in 1665 to 1678. Um, the original building was built and the facade was added several years later. Um, it was Borromini's first commission and he was really trying to impress the Romans. He really wanted to show what he was capable of. To some degree, you could say that he was sort of trying to show up Bernini. Um, however, the church was much, is much smaller than anything Bernini ever had to work with. In addition to um, the patrons of this church were from a small Catholic order. They didn't have a lot of money. And so Borromini had a lot of financial restrictions. He also had space restrictions. And the design of the church was dictated to him in a way that um, was unusual. See, the church spans the block. It's sort of on a corner. And there was a fountain that was already in place on the corner. And they wanted him to work with the space that was already there. And so he had to fit a church, a sacristy, a refectory, a library, and a, clo a cloister into this small space. Um, he does it successfully. And he even leaves room for a garden. He uses a very sculptural treatment for the architecture. Um, he offers the public a building that's curvilinear. This is something that's preferred by the Baroque architect over the traditional flat walls of the high Renaissance buildings. Um, he initiates a change to oval floor plans for small churches during the Baroque period. So once he designs this particular work of art or church, um, the smaller churches tend to like this oval shape that he invents. Um, in the High Renaissance, these type of churches were round, usually. Um, if you recall the um, Tepieto that was in Rome, um, this church um, was sort of a modified uh, variation. Instead of being a circular plan, it was an oval plan. Um, the oval plan gave a dynamic looking ceiling. It gave an opportunity for um, a more elongated space than the circle would have. Um, and it created a dramatic use of light and shadow um, on the in the facade of the building and in the interior of the building. Um, the church was not well received by the public. For one thing, it was very avant-garde. It was very um, cutting edge. And to some degree, the people of Rome just weren't ready for this church that was so opulent and odd in its angles and shapes. Even though he changes the prefer to the preferred small floor plan for the rest of the Baroque period, um, the people of Rome just really did not care a lot for his church. Um, the facade definitely undulates in and out, uh, but you see it spans the city block. Um, the facade of the church faces the street, and that's where you enter the church. And it's a little odd because it almost seems like you should be entering the church from the street corner where the fountain is. So it sort of puts the door in a weird position. Um, in addition... He adds uh, the garden at the roof line. Um, it was an ingenious use of space, uh, but it wasn't something that was well received by the public. Um, you can see here through the close-up how this building undulates in and out of the viewer's space. The facade um, pushes and pulls back and forth um, to enter into the viewer's space so um that's another that's one of those hallmarks of baroque architecture it's a hallmark of baroque art altogether that undulation into the viewer's space whether it's a statue a painting a building 
they all seem to create a spatial relationship with the viewer. Now, obviously, a painting um, does it sort of psychologically, whereas in a sculpture or in the buildings, it does it physically. Poor Borromini really never gets out of the shadow of Bernini. Um, he was devastated that the public did not think that this was a masterpiece and that they did not feel that his building was of great design. And at the age of 68, he commits suicide. Um, and we think it was because he never got out of Bernini's shadow in Rome. So this is the um, ceiling gallery of the Palazzo Farnese. It's in Rome, and it was done in 1597 to 1601. It is a fresco, approximately 68 feet by 21 feet. Um, and it was designed for the Farnese family. It was designed by Michelangelo, but painted by Anibale Caracci. Um, the room was designed to house a major collection of antiques that um, the nephew Ordorado was being given as a wedding present. The collection of antiques was a testament to the power and wealth of the Farnese family. Um, the niches held sculptures of great antiquity, and Nibley's paintings were supposed to reflect the classicism of the antiques. Um, there was a program designer and his name was Fluvio Orsini and the program was the idea of what kind of subject matter would be in the painting um, and the theme of the program was the loves of the gods so the program director was a scholar that helped choose the subject matter that's presented in the illusionistic fresco. Um, the thing that's really cool about this fresco is that you cannot tell what is a sculpture and what is painting. And it's all supposed to sort of create an environment that is like an alternate reality. We don't know which is three-dimensional and which is not. So I had mentioned that one of the interesting things about the ceiling fresco is that it looks as if there was a painting that was painted and framed and then hung directly on the ceiling. And in all actuality, uh, what has happened is that the paintings are painted directly on the ceiling um, and then there's a frame built around the painting on the ceiling and sometimes the frame is actually painted uh, but we just can't tell which is actual frame and which is actual painting this phenomenon is called quadro riportato um, we consider there would be three layers of reality in this scene of painting the um, actual painting that's on the uh, plaster itself, the fresco, and then the built structure of the frame, and then there are actually sculptures there. Uh, this actual system has an interesting story behind it. Anibale Carace was paid about $500 for um, three years of really hard work daily on this set of paintings. Now, if we think about how much $500 is back then, that seemed like a lot of money. But in all actuality, it's about getting, it's like getting like $20 for a month worth of work. Um, and I think Nibley was hurt by this gesture. Um, he felt that the Frenese family had done him wrong. And five years later, after he painted it, he died of a nervous breakdown. Um, and they think it had to do with the fact he felt so unappreciated for this painting. Um, something funny about this painting is the putti actually urinate from the corners, and it trickles down the sides of the walls. Um, which 
We once again are reminded that Michelangelo was the designer of all of the paintings and the um, layers of the fresco, and so we see his idealism and classicism in the anatomy of the characters, but also the realism that um, Michelangelo came up with. So the last superstar of the Baroque period that we're going to talk about is Caravaggio. Um, there's a couple of things I need you to know about the Baroque period. There are kind of two schools of thought. There's this Caravaggio school of thought, and you will see as we look at other artists, or if you're looking in your book, there are other artists that follow in Caravaggio's footsteps. Once Caravaggio comes on the scene, he changes the way artists depict art. You can quite easily pick out a Caravaggio follower. Um, the other school of thought is the classical school of thought, or the followers of Anibale Caracci. Um, those are artists who kind of like the mythological subject matter, um, stick to things like Anibale Caracci did, have that classical look in their figures, things like that. So let's talk about Caravaggio. So Caravaggio was a really colorful character. He is an artist that art historians study quite a bit because we kind of are trying to get in his head. He had an intense temper but his works were, and his works were somewhat violent. Um, they were violent in terms of extreme lighting, um, but the subject matter that he depicted was often very violent. Uh, he is a counter-reformation painter, so he's following the rules of the church in terms of being overly realistic and to the point of being grotesque. Um, but we feel that we can see his temper in his work, um, or his extreme moods, mood changes in his work. Um, some art historians feel that they can see indications that Caravaggio was gay, um, and they think that he was possibly working his sexual frustrations out. Um, through the canvas. We probably aren't going to look at very many pieces that you would be able to see that in, um, but it's important that you know if you are looking at a large body of Caravaggio's work that um, art historians have considered that thought. Uh, the original source writer about Caravaggio in this time is Mancini. Um, and Caravaggio really begins his career as a starving artist. The first thing that he seems to do are studies of still lives that he sells on the street. Um, he gets the idea from Flemish artists like Peter Eretzen, and he's known for this dramatic type of chiaroscuro called tenebrism. It's a dynamic illusionism, um, and it's a way of creating dramatic effect in the painting. We'll look at some of it. Um, we always question as art historians where Caravaggio fell in his faith. Does he have profound faith or is he making fun of the Catholic faith? And that's something that as you look at these paintings you might want to try to think about. Um, we can see that there's a change in his career throughout, or a change in his style throughout his career. Um, in his later works, he kind of gets a thin, sketchy application of paint. Um, interesting, in 1606, he commits murder because he loses a tennis match and he just gets so angry that he kills his opponent. In 1607, a year after the murder, um, he flees to Malta and spends the rest of his life uh, running from the police. 
Um, he was actually knighted. He was knighted um, by uh, one of the rulers in Valletta. Um, and he becomes the Grand Master of the Court uh, in Valletta. And at the time in Valletta, of course, they don't know anything about Caravaggio's temperament. Here's a timeline of Caravaggio's um, major, the major things that could go on in Caravaggio's career in life. He really only paints, um, or he dies at the age of 39, so he doesn't really paint for that long. But he does produce an amazing amount of work in the time that he does paint. So we've talked a lot about Caravaggio's life. Let's talk about Caravaggio's art. This is Caravaggio's The Road to Emmaus. Um, it's a Bible story, and the way the Bible story goes is that um, two men are walking from having just seen Jesus' body gone from the tomb. And as they walk down the road from Emmaus, they uh, are sad. They're talking about how much they will miss their beloved teacher and they feel um, sort of abandoned. And a man appears to them and talks to them and goes to dinner at their house. And they don't realize until he leaves that they just had dinner with Jesus. Um, so let's talk about artistic style. The Baroque was really a rejection of the manner, mannerism, artificiality, and strangeness, um, in favor of returning to clarity and realism. Uh, but the realism was mandated by the Council of Trent and was more through going and far reaching in its effort to engage the audience than anything that the Renaissance had attempted. The new styles created in Italy, but eventually it spreads to the whole of Europe, uh, so that even artists working in the Protestant areas like Holland work in this Baroque style. Um, but the artist who most forcefully explores its implications of utter realism is Caravaggio. His real name was not Caravaggio, it was Michelangelo Merci of Caravaggio, but we call him Caravaggio. Um, he was in search of greater realism. He enlarges the boundaries of what we, what could be done in art. He's one of the most revolutionary, influential artists of the Western tradition. And he takes up the Council of Trent's call for art that's real, as perfectly real as possible, and pushes it as far as he can. Um, this particular painting, The Supper at Emmaus, is the perfect illustration of the new levels of realism that he gives art. Um, In the Renaissance works, we get a, you get a sense of time, but Caravaggio gives us a more vivid sense of time. His work suggests a more split second timing, a sense of frozen in place. We don't see this kind of split second timing in a sense of frozen stillness until we get to photography. This is a revolutionary idea. Um, we see it really prevalent in the man who sits uh, perpendicular to Jesus on his left hand side where he stretches out his arms into the front of the picture plane creating a relationship with the viewer. His arms carry your eyes directly to Jesus. There's a more dynamic sense of movement. 
that thrusting of the arms that's sent to the front of the picture plane suggests a more vivid sense of space. Without his arms there, we wouldn't feel the sense of depth that the table brings. Caravaggio's figures tend to all project out from the world that they are in into ours. He does this with the use of dramatic angles. Christ extends his hand and the still life that hangs over the edge of the table seems to emerge with the painting from the painting world into our world. All of the heightened degrees of realism, the heightened degree of sense of space, the split second timing that we see, the sense of explicit motion, um, a vivid sense of psychology, become hallmarks of Baroque art. And no matter where you look in Europe, you can look in Italy, Spain, France, Flanders, or Holland, you find these new levels of realism in the artwork that's produced. They were all pioneered by Caravaggio and they influence every single artist in Europe in the 1600s. You're either from the Caravaggio school of thought and strive to have paintings like him or you reject his school of thought altogether and strive to have paintings that are more done in the classical ideals. The image that you see here shows you a close-up of that split-second timing in the arms stretched out from the man on Jesus' left. You can also see the fine attention to detail and texture that we get in Caravaggio's work, um, something obviously from the influence of the northern traditions that Caravaggio carries into his paintings. So this painting is called The Calling of St. Matthew by Caravaggio. Um, and of course you can see the basic chiaroscuro in the calling of St. Matthew because you can see the turning of the figure and how the body turns in space and light. Um, this is humanism to the extreme because at this point we can't really tell which figure is Jesus unless uh, someone were to point it out to you or unless you knew the story of the calling of St. Matthew. Um, the tenebrism that we're talking about is that bright light that shines on the face of the boy. Um, it comes from the use of only one light source. We're going to look at another painting that I think you're going to be able to see that tenebrism just a little bit better. It's important that you read fully about this painting in your book. I'll tell you a little bit about it, but I want you to understand the full story behind it. Um, so Jesus is coming to call the disciple Matthew um, to follow him. And if you remember, Matthew was a tax collector. And so they're all sitting together at the table in the pub. And Jesus comes to call on St. Matthew. And it's that split second timing where Jesus is saying, I pick you, Matthew. And um, each of the participants are saying, which one of us are you calling? Because he's not actually speaking. Um, the challenge I give you is which, which person in this painting is Jesus? Um, I'll let you think a minute and then I'll tell you. The person that is Jesus is the person pointing with the hand stretched out. Um, and the thin beard. So we don't really see Jesus' face. It's not a major um, component of this particular piece. It's that action or that piece in the story, the action of the piece in the story. And that's kind of how Caravaggio draws us in is because he's telling a story and he wants us to understand the point of the story. 
Um, this painting is huge, and the pious response that's to be evoked from looking at the painting is to say, is he calling me? So this is um, Caravaggio's painting called The Conversion of St. Paul. It's in the Carassi Chapel in Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome. Um, this is that split second time in the story where Saul, who is Paul's name before he gets his Christian name, um, is called or hears the calling of Jesus and we see that he falls off of his horse, that he's so moved. Um, the tenebrism is that direct light that's shining on the main character, Paul, there. And you can see that he draws us into the story with the angle with which he places Paul to the canvas. So our eye kind of goes directly to the body or the head of Paul and then we look to see what's going on within the horse. This is hyper realism. You can see every muscle that that horse has. You can see the um, musculature of Saul's arms and the veins in his hands. You can see the way the fabric lies on the ground. It is 100% realism pushed to the fullest. So I wanted to stop here for a second and focus on that word that I used called tenebrism. Um, in Caravaggio's paintings, we see the tenebrism as something that looks almost like he took a flashlight and shined it in this one spot in the painting and then left everything else a darker color. Tenebrism is just that. It's that spotlight. It's a harsh light. It adds drama. Um, it's not soft. Um, it's sort of like um, being on stage with a spotlight at you. Um, I always give this analogy, if you remember when you were a little kid and you used to go camping or you had a slumber party at night and you'd take a flashlight and stick it under your chin and tell a scary ghost story. Um, and it created this really weird glow for the person who had the flashlight in their hands. Um, that is tenebrism. It's this like extreme focal point of light. So this page gives you more information about the conversion of St. Paul. Um, I do want to just encourage you to keep looking more and more at Caravaggio's work. There's more work in your book. Um, especially I want you to kind of take in the idea of how does he draw in the viewer? What is he saying to the viewer um, in his works of art? Uh, like I told you in the Matthew piece, he was asking us to consider the idea of is, am I being called the way Matthew is being called? And so I just want you to keep looking at the pieces that Caravaggio does and see if you can figure out what mind trick is he using to pull us, the viewer, into the painting So Caravaggio's entombment is really a highlight of all of the split-second timing that, um, and of the bringing the scene into the viewer's space. Um, it's sort of a culmination and heightened example. You do see, though, his influence of training in the Mannerist discipline when you look at the entombment. First you see a man that stands completely in the back with his hands thrown up to the sky in a very emotional gesture. Then a woman that stands in front of that man. We cannot see either of those two people's legs. The legs of the man that we see the most of, other than Jesus, is the man that holds the lower half of Jesus's body and lowers him into the tomb. 
Then there's a man that stands to that man's left, and it's hard to tell how, uh, whose arm that, uh, red, whose arm the red cape shrouds behind the man who's lowering Jesus into the tomb's head. Now, to really understand this painting, I would want to show it to you completely in person. Unfortunately, we are not at the Uffizi Gallery in Italy, and so I can't. However, what I want to, well, actually, I think this is in a chapel. Um, but what I want you to recognize is that the painting is over life size. So the men that are standing there are full six feet long. Um, as well as Caravaggio gets an intense amount of space in this particular work of art. And so we know that it's at least, it's six feet tall at least. Um, I believe it's almost 12 feet tall. So when you walk up to the image, right at your eye level is Jesus being lowered into the tomb. Jesus is being lowered into the tomb in a very realistic way. We see Jesus looking very human. He is not full of blood though. Um, obviously he's been shrouded and cleaned up from the crucifixion and he's being uh, lowered into a tomb. That act of lowering into the tomb is an act that actually brings you, the viewer, into the painting. Why? Because there's no tomb present. The lowering of the tomb is Caravaggio handing you Jesus' body. It begs the question, of Christianity. The cr question of Christianity that says, this is your Lord and Savior. Do you accept him and lower him into the tomb? And so Caravaggio's storytelling is pushed to new heights with entombment. He's always been a very good storyteller, but now he's actually involving you as the viewer into the story. This is something that um, many, many, many artists strive to achieve, is to involve the viewer into the art so much so that you're asking theological questions of yourself. Um, the church would have been the commissioner of this piece of work and therefore um, it, it was meant to evoke the pious response. The pious response would be, of course I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I shall help put him in the tomb. Um, obviously that's the answer that the clergy wants you to come up with as you view the work of art in the chapel. So these next few slides are simply detailed images of the entombment. And they're images that I've included because I want you to be able to see the, um, uh, the different sort of touches that Caravaggio adds to the painting to make it as real as possible. So the first one I'm showing you is this um, close up of the man that throws his hands up in the back of the uh, painting. He throws his hands up to the sky and uh, definitely mirrors the mannerist style that we saw in Pintormo's entombment. Um, you'll get a little exercise in the homework about it. Here's a close up of Jesus being lifted into the tomb. Um, you can see that his body uh, is as real as possible. We've got really great muscle detail. The thing I would say about this, though, is that 
When a body is dead, it doesn't get this kind of muscle detail. It pretty much hardens. Um, and so, uh, through rigor mortis. And so, this um, lifelike look almost feels like Jesus is asleep. Here, um, you see the face of the man that lowers Jesus into the tomb. Uh, you see the muscle tension in his legs uh, as he lifts this 200-pound man into the tomb. Uh, here you can see the scar uh, that the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with to make sure that he was dead. And then again, a close-up of the man's face. Um, as he strains to lift Jesus into the tomb. Here's a picture of the um, rock that covers up the grave. Um, you can see how there is really no setting in this painting. Um, the setting is them lowering Jesus into the tomb. But other than that, there's no background setting of any kind, very much like the Mannerist works, but so opposite of the Mannerist works in the realism that we see through Caravaggio's work. And last but not least, this important slide to show you how large the painting is. You can see that right at the viewer's eye level is where the tomb sits. And so, it feels as if Caravaggio is handing you Jesus' body himself. So this artist is obviously a follower of Caravaggio's. Um, how do I know that? Because of the tenebrism that goes directly to the main character, um, Holofernes, that's being beheaded. Um... Artemisia Janileski is the name of the woman who painted this particular piece. And Janileski has a really interesting story behind her art. She was a female artist, and her father's name was Orozio Janileski. And Orozio had made a name for himself in the late Renaissance, early Baroque period, and the only reason that Artemisia was allowed to become an artist was because she had her father um, to school her. Her father also uh, ha hired her a tutor who was really good at illusionistic painting. And her tutor actually um, raped her. And so a lot of... The works by Artemisia Janileski feature some pretty intense brutality between men and women. Um, and many artists contemplate whether or not, or many art historians think that Artemisia may have been working out the brutality that she faced with men through her artwork. Nonetheless, you can see that she has this intense... Um, attention to detail, just the same as Caravaggio. She does an incredible job of showing us that split-second timing. Like, this is the split-second that Artemisia plunged this uh, sword into Holofernes' neck, and blood is just grotesquely squirting everywhere. We see intense realism with the folds and the fabric and the subject matter. Um, the thing that's wonky is the angle that Artemisia paints um, Judith beheading Holofernes. And the maid really has no... Um, she's kind of grossed out. She's holding the sack with which to catch Holofernes' head. Um... I encourage you to look at more of Artemisia's work. There is more in your book. Um, but look at it with that eye of remembering that she has this 
uh, traumatic past and see if you can see some of that in her paintings. So this work of art is by Rainey. Um, it's titled Aurora and it's the ceiling fresco in the casino Respio Raspigli. I'm sorry, my Italian just not so great. Um, Raspigliosi. So, Rennie begins his career in the manners, mannerist discipline, um, but then he moves to the academy in Rome where he focuses his training on classicism, and of course he's exposed to Caravaggio's work. Um, you can see Michelangelo's influence in the muscle structure of the figures and the voluminous fabrics that he paints. Uh, this is a mythological allegory. It's an allegory of time. Uh, Aurora leads Apollo. Darkness gives away to light. And uh, the hours of time are the horses. It has quadro riportato, and it was commissioned by um, Cardinal Scipione Borghese, who was a major patron of the arts at the time. Uh, I just want you to take a good look at the image, see if you can pick out the classical style, see if you can pick out Michelangelo's influence in terms of depiction of the figure. This is an illusionistic fresco by Cortonia. It is called The Triumph of the Barberini. It's a ceiling fresco in the Grand Salon of Palazzo Barberini in Rome. It was commissioned by Pope Urban VIII, and it was an ambitious project for Cortonia. Cortonia was an experienced fresco painter, but he had never painted a fresco of this magnitude in scale and complexity. Um, the scene was divided into sections, figurative sections versus architectural sections. Um, and the sections allowed him to hire artists or teams of artists to help him paint the fresco. During the time that Cortonia and his team are working on the fresco, uh, he takes a break and goes on a trip to Venice. There he sees art in the Doge's palace um, that he was very impressed with. It had a highly, or a lot of impact on his um, thought process as an artist. He felt that the paintings at the Doge's palace were really dynamic and didn't rely on foreshortening so much to um, sort of place the figure in space. And so he comes back to Rome and he destroys a substantial portion of the painting, uh, stating that he's unhappy with the way it turns out and he decides to repaint it. A year later, he unveils it to Pope Urban VIII, who is ecstatic about how the painting went. And um, it ends up being a very great success for Cortonia's career. The illusionistic fresco has this really fascinating ability to make the ceiling feel extended into the heavens. Um, it's almost as if you have a split second timing look into the mythological unseen. It has groups of people uh, that are sort of clumped together in various places and it feels as if the architecture extends beyond the roof line. Illusionistic fresco is very complex. It's um, something that I would say is very dramatic and impressive. I've never gotten to see illusionistic fresco on this magnitude or in this scale um, personally. And so I can only tell you about it. I highly encourage you if you ever get to go to Rome to go see this work of art, um, The Triumph of the Barberini. There are many symbols of the Barberini in the um, fresco, the Barberini were a rich family um, that had many ties to the clergy in Rome at this time.
Here's another one of those um, illusionistic frescoes. This one is not quite as architecturally focused as the one that we just looked at from Cortonia. It is by Gali. Um, it has clumps of figures just like Cortonia's uh, in which he would have hired people to paint the figures as well as places where the ceiling has a more architectural feel to it. Uh, it does seem as if it extends into the heavens. You get this window within the ceiling. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is the fresco also has stucco figures um, on the painting itself or stucco figures in the ceiling. So it's this push and pull between the painting and the sculpture. Um, in the sculpture, you see these plaster figures, but from the ground, there's no way to tell what's painting and what's sculpture. And it creates sort of an environment for the viewer. It's very much a, um, oh, I, I don't want to say ancient. It's very much, uh, I guess I'll use ancient for lack of a better word. It's a very much an ancient representation of a total experience um, so if virtual reality had been a thing back then this is virtual reality for the baroque time it's a way to control the senses of the viewer um, illusionistic fresco was something that uh, went as far as to have actual running water fountain within the painting and the idea is that you can't see the difference between the painting and between the sculpture and between the thing that is reality and so it creates this sense of total experience for the viewer that um pushing of the viewer interaction is very much part of illusionistic fresco painting in the baroque This is Saint Serpion done by Zerbarin. The painting is really one of the most stark and austere of Zerbin's representation of saints. Um, the face of the saint is obscured by the large cowl neck um, of the robe and the robe's shadows uh, hit the light and concentrate on the coarse patched habit um and on the uh sort of uh bony facial structure of the saint's body um it is probably we think it may have been a little bit earlier than 1628 um but it, because it precedes the second picture of St. Francis in the National Gallery, um, and it is signed and dated for 1639. Um, this is really not a painting that you would expect of a saint. It's one with a bleak and sort of grave depiction of a saint. It's uh, the saint being crucified. It's him being um, tied up and punished. Um, there's sort of an air of menace about the work of art. It's a matter that conjures uh, the artist, uh, conjures up a question it's is this the artist's idea or is it the people who commissioned the painting's idea to make the work feel dark and sinister um it focuses on how tortured the saint was um it has to be remembered that during this time uh that the artist painted the image there were several monastic orders in spain that had gone out to challenge painters and sculptors to bring more to life than re bring religious figures more to life 
um, in their works of art. And um, the religious orders thought that if they requested this, that the saints be more humanized, that the saints be more sort of have a story behind them, um, that the viewers would be inspired to imitate the saints and um, how they came across in the art. I suppose it's sort of like a modern day, um, it was sort of the clergy's way of manipulating the public, sort of like a modern day um, advertisement. Uh, I suppose perfume ads are coming to my mind. Uh, when you see a perfume ad for women's perfume or men's cologne, the perfume ad usually has this like super fit model in it that uses this cologne and there's usually a romantic encounter involved in the ad. And so to some degree it's selling this idea of sexism that if you are um, wearing this cologne, you will be sexy and attractive to the opposite sex. So uh, women, people look at these ads and say, well, I want to be like that person in the ad. Um, very similar to what the Catholic Church is trying to do. They want to evoke pious response. And in Spain, they're um, pushing that pious response through the imagery in which the artist paints. Um, to some degree, the viewers are coming face to face with a religious hero. Um, many of the Spanish artists studied uh, in sort of a polychromatic, uh, polychroming wooden sculptures. Um, we know that Zabarzin uh, studied those uh, polychrome sculptures. And um, Velasquez learned how to paint the surfaces of the sculptures, um, as well as Zabarzin learned how to paint the surfaces of those sculptures as part of their artistic training. Um, The background is very plain, it's very dark, and so it adds a stark contrast to the monk's habit. Um, This idea of meditation on death was looked upon by the Jesuits as a religious exercise. It was considered to be a probable point of union with the ultimate truth. Um, saints contemplating skulls were often seen in Spanish and Italian paintings in the 17th century. And so um, we sort of see this saint... Uh, lost in a sense of meditation and facing his own dark, deep inner self, um, knowing that he's going to face his own dark, deep uh, end at some point. Um, we see that his mouth is slightly parted. He's closed his eyes um, out of exhaustion. Uh, he utters words of prayer. Um, his habit is patchy and war well worn um, and doesn't feel like it would be comfortable to wear. Uh, the habits held together with a dark brown rope. And we can see how the light falls on the thread 
um, especially near the elbow. Uh, the artist is reminding us of the saint's vows of poverty. And we're also to believe that this is a working man by the way the artist has shown his hands and his dirty fingernails. Um, many times monasteries were working places in which the monks worked very hard during the day. They spent much time in prayer. Um, and the Catholic Church wants to attract more people to this pious um, life. So this is Velasquez. He was born in Seville, and he had great exposure to Venetian painting through Madrid. He begins his career in a style that's very hard-edged photograph, uh, photorealism type style. Um, that realistic style that he does is so very real that it almost feels like you can touched the textures um, you can feel the water of the textures in your mind um, in the early years everything that he does is very crystal clear um, he goes to Madrid and then everything changes he gets this so the last Baroque superstar that we're going to talk about is Diego Velasquez Velasquez was a Spanish artist, um, and the piece that we are looking at is called The Water Carrier of Seville, and it was done in 1619 and is currently at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, Velasquez was quite an incredible painter. He was a follower of Caravaggio in the beginning, um, at the, in the early stages of his career. In fact, uh, if you look at this painting in your book, you will see that the water jug actually has sweat on it from the water. So the water is cool, uh, the young man is assisting the priest, and the priest asks him to run into the square and fetch this or fill the jug full of water. And so you can see the water droplet that's sweating on the side of the jug. It is quite beautiful. You can also see that the jug was made uh, with by hand building. So in other words, um, you can see the rings that uh, is created when building the pottery. Quite incredible the amount of detail that's gone into this painting. The painting is an allegory for time. You can see that the um, young boy is the early stages of man, the priest is the middle age stage of man, and the man in the background is the older stage of man. Um, this painting is just quite beautiful and it's hyper realistic. Let's look at some of um, Velasquez's work as time goes on. So this is Velasquez's Philip the Fourth. And it was done in 1644. I want to point out to you uh, a very important term that we are going to talk about quite a bit as Art History 2 continues to roll, and that is the term impasto. Um, impasto is a technique in which the artist builds layers of paint up on the canvas. When Velasquez begins his career, he begins his career with a very sharp, exact, and precise hyper-realism in his paintings, like we saw in the um, Water Carrier of Seville. But as he gets older throughout his career, um, he takes trips and sees Venetian art and does uh, some travel and in those travels he picks up a love for a more painterly effect in his work um, and he begins exploring that painterly effect here in this painting of Philip IV. Um, 
The impasto comes in the lace and in the white detailing of Philip's uh, tunic. Philip is sort of a homely man. He has a very large chin. Uh, and so Velasquez turns him at a three-quarter profile view to sort of take away from this uh, very um, harsh jawline. He also gives him this uh, handlebar mustache because it adds some dimension to the face that's very, very long. Um, and I have seen this painting in person. The impasto is absolutely incredible. It catches the light just so that it almost feels like Philip IV's tunic sparkles when it catches the light. Now, is that possible? No, because there is no reflective element actually in the paint. Um, but it definitely catches the light and bounces it back at the viewer. Okay, so this painting is called Las Meninas, and it was done in 1656, which is actually um, 50 years later than the water carrier of Seville. And if you look closely, you can see that there's some sense of sketchiness added to this work. Um, Velasquez develops a technique called impasto. Impasto is the thick building of paint on the canvas that creates a texture. Um, the Impressionists were famous for it, but he was the very first one that did it. Las Meninas is sort of a trick that Velasquez is playing with us. You see, Velasquez is the man or the artist that's painting the painting. He's looking out at us as he paints the painting of these children or the Les Enfants. Las Meninas means um, young dolls. And so you can see King Philip in the background. He's just leaving. Portraits at this time were done in stages. One person would sit for a portrait and then leave and then another person would come in and sit for the portrait. And so Velasquez is painting the um, L'Enfant, who is the young girl in the family who will be added into the portrait. And these are the other women are the people who are hired to entertain her. You'll notice that there is a um, dwarf there to entertain her. Velasquez worked in the court for King Philip. And it was interesting because he... Um, really had a soft spot in his heart for dwarves. They were paid to entertain young children and often um, because of their size. They were so small that they were like the size of the young children and so he just felt like they were treated unfairly and judged poorly and wanted to give them more dignity than what the royal court had given them. You can see um, a mirror in the background, the mirror is the reflection of what's going on in the room or of the painting so that you can see that now we're adding new figures to the painting. Uh, Velasquez wears a red cross on his uh, apron. It is the symbol of knighthood. He was knighted at the urging of King Philip um, who wrote the Pope and asked for him to be knighted and so the cross was actually added later after this painting was completed because um, Velasquez wasn't knighted for several years afterwards. Las Meninas has a really beautiful um, sense of sketchiness to it. What changes Velasquez's career or allows him to add more sketchiness, he goes to Italy, he goes twice to buy paintings for King Philip. Um, and collect art for King Philip. And while he's there, he meets Rubens, and um, he studies with him a bit, and he picks up some of Rubens' style. Um, and we'll see Rubens' paintings in the next half of this chapter. But what you'll notice is there's a sense of softness here that wasn't there before. Um, when we compare Las Meninas to the water carrier, the water carrier is, like, crisp, as if you're looking through 
crystal clear glass. And Las Meninas has a little bit more of a softer focus. The impasto technique that we talked about in um, Velasquez's portrait of Philip IV is definitely used in Velasquez's Las Meninas. This is a close-up of the Le Enfant. She is the um, young woman that is uh, being focused on here in the painting. Um, even though there are a lot of things going on in the painting, the impasto is something that really is explored thoroughly in the treatment of the clothing in Las Meninas. Um, I've shown you a close-up here of the flower brooch that the infant wears on her dress, and you can see the thick buildup of paint on the canvas in the highlights of the costuming. So this is Velasquez. He was born in Seville and he had great exposure to Venetian painting through Madrid. He begins his career in a style that's very hard edged photograph, uh, photo realism type style. Um, that realistic style that he does is so very real that it almost feels like you can touch the textures. Um, you can feel the water of the textures in your mind. Um, in the early years, everything that he does is very crystal clear. Um, he goes to Madrid and then everything changes. He gets this selective focus, and then he begins to portray mythological and spiritual themes in his paintings uh, through the lens of domestic genre. He takes two trips to Italy. One was by the ur ur urging of Rubens, uh, and that happened in 1629, and then again he goes back to... Italy in 1650. Both trips were taken to buy art for King Philip, who he worked in King Philip's court.